Hello, everybody. So today I'm going to start a new series, and I'm going to call this the recap for the modules that we covered, right? And the first thing I'm going to start, obviously, will be the module one. And in module one, what we did was we introduced the fluid mechanics to you. I also talk about a few important parameters that I'm going to use for the rest of the modules. Okay? And I also gave you the definition of the fluids as well as a couple other things. And in this session, I will review them for you. And I'm making this interactive. Hopefully, this will be more, a better experience for you as students. All right? At first, what I did was I talked about different courses in the mechanical curriculum. And I told you where my class particularly fits. Okay, as a relation to salt mechanics, as a relation to thermodynamics, heat transfer, etc. And I also told you a couple of important examples from different disciplines just to see the broad impact of what you're learning in my class. Okay, I gave you the example of aerospace engineering, civil engineering, obviously mechanical, chemical engineering is also important, they do transport, right? Uh, and after that, what I did was I gave you the definition of the fluids. And what I did say was, a substance that deforms continuously. That's the definition of the fluids. Now, you may tell me that, hey, if I have a block of aluminum, if I put a shit this way, right, it will deform. Yeah, that's fine. But the thing that I'm talking about here is not a slight deformation. I'm talking about infinite deformation, right? So if you think about the riverbed, right, although it is, the angle is fairly small, right, it's flowing all day long. That's what I'm talking about when I say this. In addition to this difference between the solids and the fluids, I also gave you one more, and that one more was more from the chemical side of things, and it's about the intermolecular forces. So if I look at the atoms for solids, they are more tightly packed, okay? But if I look at the fluids, they are more, more loose. In fluids, in let's say the water, it's a bit further apart, and if I have a gas, it's even much further apart from one another. As well. As you know, the fluids will be separated into two. Okay? One will be the liquids, while the other one will be the gases, right? You kind of know this, this is a general knowledge, but I'm quantifying this now. And what I'm saying is the difference between the liquids and the gases are that the liquids are incompressible. What that means, if I have a volume of a liquid, I cannot simply put into the smaller volume for a given mass, right? But for gases, I can accomplish this, okay? Because I can change my temperature or pressure, so basically my thermodynamic state, so I can have a different density value. From that, I can put into a container of what I want because there's something called the compressed air, right? That's where it's coming from. So that was the difference between the liquids and the gases, all right? And I also briefly talked about the system of units. This is important, right? I have the SI unit, standard international, length is meter, force is Newton, right, that. And also I have a British gravitational unit that we use here in the US, right? The, the unit of length is foot, not an inch, right? And the force, for instance, is pounds, right? And then I started to talk about the important fluid definitions. And the first one that I talk about is the density. You kind of know that density is equal to mass divided by volume, right? And we said that the density is constant for liquids, very variable depending on my thermodynamic state, for gases. And the next thing was the specific weight, and I gave you the motivation behind it. It occurs a lot in my class. So what we did was we had the density, and I multiplied that by the gravity to the acceleration, and I called this a specific weight. And the other thing that I did was I talked about specific gravity. Specific gravity is a normalized density. I normalized the density of what I'm dealing with divided by the density of water at 4 degrees C, right? So I get myself a non-dimensional number, makes my life a little bit easier. And then I started to talk about the pressure. Okay, That's a bit of an involved term. And I said that, hey, this is a force which is normal to the surface divided by the area that this force is acting on. Okay, That's the definition. And I gave you two different ways that you can represent this. One is the gauge pressure, where I reference my pressure with respect to the atmospheric. Right? And the other one is the absolute pressure, where I reference it to all the way to vacuum. Right? An important thing is that I can get a negative gauge value, gauge pressure can be negative, but I cannot have a negative absolute value because I'm starting at zero vacuum, there's nothing else to go below that. Okay? And then I went on to talk about the viscosity. Viscosity is very important, and 
this is the only course that you will learn is cost in the entire undergraduate mechanical engineering curriculum. Every time I offer this course, I test students on this, so be careful about it. Viscosity, it quantifies the resistance of a fluid being sheared. Okay? And I introduced a particular theorem, I call this no-slip theorem, right? So basically, if I have a solid and if I have a fluid touching it, they need to move with the same velocity. If they're not moving, they're going to be stationary. If they're moving 5 meters per second in this direction, they're going to move with 5 meters per second together. Okay? And I gave you the then I kind of went ahead with the derivation of the viscosity and I gave you shear stress is equal to viscosity times du dy. Be careful about this du dy. Sometimes I, I see this, this is acceleration. That's not quite right. Acceleration is du dt, right? This is dy. This is the basically the rate of change of velocity in the perpendicular direction. All right, the tau is equal to viscosity times du dy. That's only for Newtonian fluids, so I want you to visualize that. Also, the viscosity that we have over the air is called the absolute or dynamic viscosity. There is another type of viscosity that's called the kinematic viscosity, and that's obtained by dividing the viscosity or absolute viscosity or dynamic viscosity. One other thing I want to talk about the difference between the liquid and a gas is how they behave as a function of the temperature. Okay? As I increase my temperature, the viscosity of a liquid goes down. On the other hand, the viscosity of a gas goes up, typically a single substance, but they go up. We also talk about something else called in viscid flow, where I said the viscosity is equal to zero. In real life, we don't have such a fluid, right? But this may be a good thing when we are doing some analytical calculation or first order approximation for our analysis. If my fluid doesn't follow this Newtonian rule, what will happen is I'm going to get the shear stress is equal to k times du dy to the power of n. So it's called power law, right? Um, and in this particular case, depending on this n value, we will have a different type of behavior from the flow. The next thing I talked about was the compressibility of a fluid. Okay? This concept is interesting because I said that liquids are incompressible and gases are compressible. You should ask me how compressible, right? We are engineers, there needs to be some number associated with it. And yes, we do. Um, so this compressibility measures, I have a given amount of volume, and I am looking at how it changes with respect to the pressure. And this quantification can be obtained by looking at the bulk modulus value. For, we know this from thermodynamics. If I have a, for a gas, if I have a compression or expansion, what will happen is there's different ways that I can achieve this. My temperature can be constant, right? That's called isothermal. Or the compression or expansion can be isentropic. That is very common as well. It's called frictionless. And we have what we have is there's no transfer of heat between the surrounding and the thermodynamic system that I'm dealing with. I also introduced an important uh, non-dimensional number in fluid mechanics. Um, and that is called the Mach number. I'm sure you have heard already, right? And I said, importantly, is if my Mach number is less than 0.3, then I don't really have to worry too much about the compressibility effects. They will be negligible as opposed to other type of forces that I will be dealing with. And at the last component of this module, what I looked at, I look at the surface tension. The surface can, tension can be negligible. The surface ten, tension can be really important. Okay, So we have to know when to use it, when we can simply go ahead and ignore it. But what it is doing is, it's, it's a basically a measure of the force at the interface between two immiscible fluids. 